Monkey is swallowing. Snake says swallowing. Next, a swallow too will fly and come and swallow. You ever swallow in a hollow galu. Making a whole lot of halabalu. Jale kalu. We know say you chop the money some, so give me the loot. Do you really want a revolution or just your turn? Because if you really want a revolution, all this for. Welcome to the Ake Arts and Books Festival 2020 online. My name is Chike Frankie Adosian, and I'll be moderating our panel discussion, Writing Queer, Writing Black, with Nakane Ture, Nicole Dennis-Ben, and Unoma Azoa. I'll just briefly give us a, a quick introduction and then we'll just jump into our conversation. So Unoma Azoa is a professor of English at Wiregrass Georgia Technical College in here in the USA. Her research and activism focuses on lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender rights in Nigeria. Recently, she concluded a book on the project of lives of gay Nigerians entitled Blessed Body, Sacred Lives of LGBTQ Nigerians. In 2011, she was listed as a top professor in the online publication, Affordable Private Colleges and Universities in the United States. She's also recognized by the Journal of Blacks in Higher Education on the topics honors for four Black educators. Some of her writing awards include the Hellman Hammett Human Rights Award, the Urban Spectrum Award for her debut novel, Sky High Flames, Aido Snyder Award for her sophomore novel, Edible Bones, and the Flora Wapa Association of Nigerian Authors Award. The prestigious Ms. Magazine describes her just released memoir, Embracing My Shadow, which we're going to be getting into, growing up lesbian in Nigeria as quite powerful. So please give a strong Ake welcome to Unoma Azua. Nicole Dennis Ben is the author of Here Comes the Sun, released in July of 2016, a New York Times notable Book of the Year and a 2017 Lambda Literary Award. Her best-selling sophomore novel, Patsy, which we're also going to get into, is a 2020 Lambda Literary Award, a New York Times Editor's Choice, a Financial Times Critic's Choice, a Stonewall Book Club selection. Patsy has been named the best book of the year by Kirkus Reviews, Time, NPR, People Magazine, Washington Post, BuzzFeed, Air, among others. Patsy fills a literary void with compassion, complexity, and tenderness, Rafe's Time Magazine. And NPR has named Dennis Ben an indispensable novelist. So please welcome her back to the Ake stage. Nakane is a South African singer, songwriter, actor, novelist. Having grown up among a Christian community in Port Elizabeth, at 15, he moved to the big city of Johannesburg, leaving the church in 2013, publicly celebrating his queerness with his debut album, Brave Confusion. He found both controversy and critical acclaim with his starring role in John Tregrove's 2017 feature film, Inexba, which is available to all of us on Netflix at the moment. And he relocated to London to record and release 2018's heavily autobiographical album, You Will Not Die. In 2015, Nakane's debut novel, Piggy Boy Blues, which we will also get into today, was set in his hometown of Alice and Port Elizabeth and portrayed a Cosa royal family. It was nominated at Barry Rowers Fiction Prize and an Etisalat novel for fiction. Please welcome him to the Ake stage. So, Nakene, is this your first Ake? This is my first one, and I'm really sad that it's- Then you get extra welcome. Virtual. I really, I then mean, I've, get, only heard, you... I've heard such, such fun things about Lagos, and I'm, I'm just, I'm really mad that the world has not allowed me to come to Lagos. Well, what I can say to you is that on behalf of everybody, welcome home because I okay. care is a writer's I care is a writer's dream, and we were, we are more than happy to discuss Piggy Boy Blues. But because you and I are gentlemen, we will do what gentlemen do, and we will start with the ladies. So of course, <laughs> so Unoma, welcome back to I care. I wanted Thank to you. ask you specifically about your wonderful memoir, because you and I are the, the non-fiction branch of this panel, <laughs> Embracing My Shadow. So I wanted to talk to you about language. And one of the things that really got me about your book was the struggle 
that people find in Nigeria describing themselves as lesbian. Can you talk about that and why that played such a recurring role in, in writing this memoir? When you say people struggle, you mean in terms of visibility? Well, in your book, you talk about how, you know, nobody wanted to be a lesbian. Nobody wanted to associate themselves with that word. And, you know, I remember one of the passages which I enjoyed so much was, I think, you flirting with somebody and somebody flirting with you. But then they're saying, but I'm not a lesbian. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> lesbian is the evil word. You dare not mention it, even if you practice it. So... It's just the one word, as in homosexuality, that you do not ever mention because mentioning it comes with a lot of implications. So, um, unfortunately, I struggle with that too. Like a lot of people do still struggle with it in Nigeria. And it just has to do with giving power to the word and then, uh, and then getting the wrath of the society that tells you that that word is a taboo, that word is an abomination. But claiming it is a kind of power that basically defies all the rules that surround the fact that in as much as you can be it, you dare not mention it. So that's what I, uh, the, the struggle, not just me, but lesbians in Nigeria is uh, one of the reasons why I decided to come up with my memoir. Uh, to share the fact that we're humans, we're every part of everyone's family, sisters, mothers, aunties, and we're not aliens. Yeah. Mm, thank you so much for that. I, I wanted to, you know, stick a little bit with language and, and, and talk to Nicole a little bit about Patsy because your book is a fantastic work of fiction, but I felt reading it like I knew all those people <laughs> and I knew, I, I knew them. I knew those men, I knew those women. I, I, these are people that I had seen, you know, growing up in Nigeria and moving to work in the United States, just like Patsy did. But I wonder, Patsy's never described as a lesbian. <laughs> right. And I just wonder, one of the similarities between all of us black people, wherever we find ourselves, you know, Patsy is a Jamaican woman living in a Jamaican culture and does what people do for, some people say a better life, some people say for love. She moves to America and gives up so much for love, but she is, I don't know, would she ever describe herself as a lesbian because she's not described as a lesbian. Is, there yeah. that, is that word so powerful also in Jamaica as it is in, in, uh, in, in Eastern Nigeria where Unoma grew up? It is, it is. And I was just nodding my head with, uh, while she was speaking because um, one of the biggest things in Jamaica is that we don't, you know, lesbian, is, you don't hear that word as much, right? Um, you don't hear transgendered either. Um, it's more like a, a, a Western um, description. So I'm writing from the perspective of a working class Jamaican woman. And she would not describe herself as a lesbian. I mean, yes, she is in love with Cicely, her best friend. And yes, she moved all the way to America with, with the hopes of loving the way she wants to love, you know, including that romance with Cicely. But she'll never describe herself as that because... You know that's that's not in a word in her vocabulary. Um, similarly, her daughter True, who she left behind in Jamaica, who is a gender non-conforming individual, but again, um, as you probably have noticed in the book itself, True would never describe herself as that. You know, um, she'll just just describe herself as you know she just she doesn't feel like a girl, but she doesn't she's not a boy either. She's somewhere in between. And that's something that um, I wanted to to make to establish in a novel like like Patsy, uh, where people um, float outside of those boxes um, of, in, ter in terms of the um, the westernized definitions of those words. Mm -hmm. So for us, you know, who we work with language, we know the power of language, and we write in language that we can say, you know, came to us from from the West. I also notice in in Piggy Boy Blues, Nakane. Your main characters, um, at least um, two of them, don't actually, I don't think any of them actually describe themselves as being gay men. I mean, one yeah. of them um, talks about 
having sex with all these women just so he can get their men, which is what he's really after. But none of yeah. them actually use yeah. that language to talk about themselves as being fully gay. Can you give us, uh, are we that similar also in South Africa that these words are, are so potent for us that we cannot describe ourselves that way? Well, I think it's a couple of things. I think the first thing is that, yes, we are quite similar in that I think a lot of people practice same-sex love and same-sex sex or whatever, but they may not necessarily feel like they have the vocabulary to identify as those people, you know, lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, et cetera, et cetera. And, and so when it comes to sexuality and when it comes to gender. But I also think that it goes back to a pre-colonial, no, pre-Western, um, well, uh, well, pre-Western, really, where Africans did have you know, a practice of sex and love that was beyond <laughs> heterosexual, right? But maybe the language, I'm not, I don't want to say the language didn't exist because it probably did, but maybe the language was different. So I really wanted to, 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 to look at those things, to sort of see if we can have these two characters, these, these particularly Gray and, and Davide, and have them in this space, which is traditionally quite known as conservative, and have them play out this relationship and not have to mention it, not have to mention it for the reader, not have to mention it for themselves. Because if, I, if the characters mentioned it, it meant that they carried the uh, the baggage of those words, right? That sometimes both places have. So saying that they're gay or bi, et cetera, et cetera, then we'd have to explain that maybe they felt bad about it. And I just didn't want to get into that. I felt like maybe a lot of queer fiction did that, a lot of that in the 90s. And I just wanted it to be a little bit more current and, and, and similar to my life and, and my friend's life. So just, um piggybacking on that in terms of your <laughs> lives and, 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 and your friends' lives. And I'd like every all of you to sort of weigh in on this because we work with words and language is very important. And when we, we are on a panel about writing queer in all of our glorious um, iterations of it, how then um, would you describe outside of Unoma who has embraced her shadow you know, but for the rest of us and people who are looking at your work, I mean, what is comfortable in describing who we are as queer black people that we can do in literature? I ask this because in particularly in Patsy and in Piggy Boy Blues, you have these people who are very clearly in love with same um, same sex and same gender people. But when Patsy is frustrated, you know, she grabs her friend's boyfriend and, you know, not just goes down on him, has a full-fledged sexual experience to sort of, you know, make herself feel better about what else is going on in her life. And then in, you know, in the case of Gray, he's actually like interested in men, but he is having sex with their girlfriend so that he can comfort the men when they break up with him. But these are queer people engaging in heterosexual sex for pleasure. And, it, and I want to talk about the fluidity of sexuality. You know, if some, when we write these characters that we know, what is the right term for us if we're doing all of these things? <laughs> yeah, I uh, so with, in Pat, in my novel Patsy, um, I play around a lot with margins. Um, if you notice, Patsy, <laughs> you should do. <laughs> but he ex he's existing on the outskirts, um, if I should say, call it that. You know, first of all, she is an unwilling mother. Um, so again, I mean, she's existing on the outskirts of her gender norm or her gender expectations as a, as a woman in society. And then, of course, she's existing as this woman who loves women for sure, but she also has sex with men, you know, and, you know, somebody could probably, if people may put her in boxes, like, oh, she's a lesbian, right? But Patsy, like I said earlier in the, um, or the question, the conversation, Patsy doesn't define herself as anything, right? She's just a sexual person. Um, yeah. You know, she loves Sicily, but she was also in love with Roy at one point in time. Roy is her, um, the father of her daughter, True. Her, um, her baby daddy. <laughs> right, exactly, right? She loved Roy, um, or thought she did, right? Um, and then, of course, falling, but always being in love with Sicily. That was one constant in Patsy's life from she was nine years old until adulthood, when she was 28. 
Um, and then, of course, ultimately meeting other women in Brooklyn, um, like Claudette, who she falls madly in love with. But yes, this was actually after she had that um, sexual encounter with her roommate's boyfriend. And, you know, it was, yes, you're right, um, Chike, that was in a moment of anger. Um, that was also a moment for Patsy where she was kind of fumbling with her, um, where she is now, you know, landing in America as an undocumented immigrant, the frustrations, everything unraveling because she was told that America would be the, um, the place where she'll finally have a choice in life. She'll finally have um, some semblance of selfhood, but she never had that. So somehow, you know, in that desperation um, to just feel close to someone, to feel held, she 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 went the, the way she was comfort for the most part through sex and you know um as another thing i needed to mention too as an immigrant um or even as a black lesbian or a black per a black queer person you're not gonna have the confidence all at all times to hit on somebody who's the same sex or se same gender so patsy is existing in a foreign country but at the time sicily had just broken her heart choosing her husband over patsy right Patsy's now living in this limbo and you know she doesn't know how to go into the gay clubs she doesn't have the courage to do that she doesn't have the courage to talk to another woman so here she's existing in her own immigrant bubble and the only thing she knows especially as socialized um you know in our in, in a culture in Jamaican culture is heteronormative behavior and so for her um in her rash decision um, to feel comforted, um, she she did what she did with Alaric, who is Fiona's um, boyfriend. Um, but yeah, but not to say that she's that she's any less, um, you know, um, a woman. <laughs> of women. It's just that she she did something that she um, you know was socialized to think or to do um, in a moment, and so that was where I was going with that. Excellent, and that was a really 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 powerful. Uh, seen in the book, it resonated with me because I, I just really thought you, you didn't have to describe the fluidity of queer people. You just showed it in a very, very interesting moment. And Nakina, I wondered if you could just pick up on that with Gray and David. And I mean, they're both courageous, but we do know that it seemed as if uh, Gray was having this sex with women just to prove a point. Yeah. Well, Gray is a the toxic character, <laughs> you know. Um, Which happens to us sometimes, yes. Yeah, and I think uh, in, initially in my initial draft of the novel, he was much more, <clears throat> excuse me, much more evil. And I remember writing in my notes, is this character just evil for evil's sake? And, and I just didn't find him interesting. But when I made, made him a, a human being, you know, with flaws and, and also really great characteristics, then he became much more interesting to me. And also I wanted to make him a little bit more likable, you know, um, so that when he does do the unspeakable, people are much more heartbroken, <laughs> you know, because writers, <laughs> writers are heartbreaking. But when I, start, when, I, when I was writing the novel, I remember making it quite clear that I wanted these characters to, to almost be living in a bubble in that house and that this house was almost a world in itself and that the rules of the world outside didn't exist, you know? So even when they left the house, they were always together, you know? So it was always about these characters, this sort of chamber piece of characters and this chamber piece of, of space. So for me, then that, I asked myself a couple of questions. I was like, if these people have no consequences in terms of who they love and who they have sex with, would they be talking about it all the time? And I, and, I, and I thought, maybe not, you know? And I also wanted to make it, you know, I wanted, I wanted to write a novel that didn't make a big deal out of it, you know? Because all the novels I've read, or at least novels by queer people, or at least novels with queer characters, had always made really big deal out of it, which, which is really, really important. Because when I read those novels, I was like, oh, there I am. But, but I just wanted to <laughs> there you are. Stop defending, come out already. But, but there came a point, you know, where I thought, oh, I wonder what you'd like to read a novel with three principal black characters in a conservative space, or at least land, but have this, this bubble where they are completely free to be themselves, you know, to participate in, in, in each other's bodies, to eat food and what they want without worrying what the rest of the world would be like. So it was almost an experiment in 
complete freedom. That's what, it, it's, mm. and so, yeah, I guess that's what I was trying to put across. Yeah, and one of the, the, the awesome things about fiction is that we can write about a world as we wish to see it, a world of complete freedom. But in reality, that's not always the case. And I wanted, I was thinking uh, when Nicole was talking about courage and Patsy not having the courage as an immigrant black woman to go to a gay club, I was just thinking about Unomar's experience as a child and as an adult in Lagos and having the courage to go up and talk to women. And I wondered, Unoma, if you could tell us about, you know, in your in your memoir, you described the courage of trying to make friends and, with women that you were interested in. But then at some point you land in Lagos, this young woman from the East who is no longer a student, she's now an adult, she's a working woman, and you get entangled with somebody else's wife. Can you talk about the courage? <laughs> Can you talk about can you talk about the courage of being a lesbian in Lagos with all of its distractions and that episode and how that shaped you in embracing your shadow? Yes, yes, that was quite an entanglement. Um, <laughs> I discovered that in smaller communities like in Suka and Asaba, for instance. There were very limited options, almost because everybody knows you. Somebody knows somebody who knows somebody who knows your mother. Yeah. So <laughs> you have to be you have to be very careful. <laughs> you have to be very careful, and uh, the challenge of trying to tell the same sex person that you're attracted to them because becomes even uh, more more insurmountable. But in a place like Lagos, the population is larger, so there's always a tendency to find somebody who may look like somebody who may not mind your mentioning that you like going to certain places. So for instance, in Lagos, I didn't even plan it. I had to go to uh, a bank to uh, solicit for ads, advertisement for uh, the Association of Nigerian Authors to get us some sponsorship. And uh, there comes this woman I was supposed to speak to and of course, she was very smashing and very attractive. And uh, I didn't expect her to be, maybe she was bisexual, maybe she was lesbian, I really didn't know. But I was happy when she showed interest. You know, it went beyond what I wanted to for her to tell me that she really liked me and I was excited. That was the first time a woman of that caliber, you know, uh, was bold enough to tell me that she wanted me to be her pet. And uh, wow. as far as I'm concerned, <laughs> yes, I mean, <laughs> if that if that will involve some petting, some smooshing, I mean, why not? So the, the transition showed me in terms of landscape that the, the smaller communities made life more difficult for me. It got easier in Lagos. And I, I just figured it was mostly because of a uh, population and the fact that nobody can actually identify you to say that they saw you doing this or that. You know, unless they'll have to go back to Asaba to tell my mother, but <laughs> nobody knows my, my village there. So, I, you know, that, that, that sort of, you know, of course, I was thinking about your experience and being with this woman who is a married woman who's very, I'm guessing, from the way you described her, quite happy in her marriage, but she wanted you um, to be her thing, her pet, her lover, as long as you sort of stayed in your lane which means that you could not be openly being her girlfriend and all of that. And I, it made me think about the sacrifices that maybe some of us queer people make just to have a life. And I wanted to talk about, with Nicole, she has this character, Patsy, who is in love with her best friend, who chooses her husband yeah. <laughs> after years of telling her that, you are the center of my world and this world is not good without you and writing all these beautiful love letters, ends up picking the man. So I'm not sure if Cicely is hetero or she's fluid or she's lesbian, but it was clear that she didn't want to let Patsy go, but she chose the man. When you were envisioning that character, which as we know from Unoma's entanglements is really true. These are real people. <laughs> These are not made up. When you were envisioning that character, were you thinking about the sacrifice that Cicely is making or the loss that Patsy's having? Yeah, so I so so first of all, Cicely, like Patsy, came to me this as in the same way. Um, they really love each other, um, but just in complex ways. I mean, Cicely's love 
it's a it's just an interesting um thing because for her it was more like her um seeing Patsy as comfort um more than anything else. Um but not that she doesn't love Patsy. But one thing is that she come she came to America as undocumented as well. And you know, most undocumented immigrants when they come here, they tend to marry, especially the um the ones who are not coming here for educational purposes. They don't have their working class um so they're not coming here in um engineering departments or phd students um visa so patsy and like sicily like patsy came here just as undocumented and so sicily ended up marrying to a man marcus who is wealthy you know he's trying to run for the mayor in brooklyn and all these things going on in his life and it's for sicily he represents to her the american dream that she craves. I mean, we still don't know what the American dream is, but in most of us, in the <laughs> fantasies that most of us have, is you know the white <laughs> home, the cars, you know the success that you could write your, your a letter to your parents back home saying I've made it, right? Mm -hmm. Cicely latched on to that, and Patsy could not give her that, even though Patsy could give her the love, the affection, the warmth, all of that. Cicely chose her American dream um, in the form of a man. You know, and this novel was set before 2012. So it's not like Cicely could have come here to marry a woman for a green card. She had to marry, she had to perform heterosexuality to marry a man for that for that paperwork. And so that was, you know, she kind of built her own prison, um, as I call it. I think, I think Cicely is one of the most tragic characters in the book because, um, of course, she had to conform. There was no um, ifs and buts about that. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't seem as if, you know, she found any kind of happiness. I think when I finished with right. Patsy, they, you seem to have tied up a lot of loose ends. But then again, it seemed like this one character who is performing heterosexuality and standing there and being the perfect wife to the politician is the one who ends up unhappy the most. Right. Yes, exactly. And it's interesting because um, one would think Patsy would be the one heading in that direction. Um, but Patsy becomes... Um, I mean, Patsy's freed by her inability or her unwillingness to conform the way Cicely had said, um, had told her to. You know, Cicely told Patsy, you know, if you want to survive in America, you have to marry a man. You know, every everybody she has encountered told her this, and she refused. She's like, I did not leave a very homophobic country to come to America, a place where we are expected to have freedoms, and just to be back in the side of the closet. Um, so in Patsy's mind, that didn't make, that did not make any sense. To her. So she chose that um, that path where she remains undocumented. She remains still yearning for love and affection, but knowing that one day she'll get her freedom, however it might come. And so for her, it was sort of, um, navigating this new realm as, of being undocumented, but unwilling to conform to how other immigrants want her to conform in order to get her papers. Excellent. Thank you so much for that. I just, one of the things that is really great about literature is the ability to finally see yourself in, in text, finally be able to see people that you recognize in literature. And for people who are queer all over the world, not just Black people, I think that it is a, it is, it is a very, very special thing when you pick up a book and you recognize someone. But part of that joyous experience that we have and that all of us have committed to putting on paper, often often comes with um, quite a bit of trauma. And I wonder, you know, Nakina, if you could talk about a very, a thing that happens to men that we don't often talk about, even among gay men, is the sexual assault and rape that sometimes happens to us. And yeah. you had this wonderful way of describing how people cope with this and that out of body experience. Can you just talk to us about why you wrote that scene and also the challenges it was to convey something so difficult, something so traumatic, but something so real that many of us recognize when we're reading the text. Wow. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, I mean, it's just a lot, brother, but you wrote the book. <laughs> well, I mean, it's really simple, actually. It's really simple in that I, I initially started writing the book when I was 20, and I finished writing it when I was about 27. And that was because I'd written the first version of the book. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've been doing it for four years. It was based on something that happened to me, actually. It was based on a rape that happened to me when I was very young, when I was 19. Initially, when I started writing the book, it was much more of a memoir. And I realized that sometimes 
well, well, artists were given this myth that you can you can take your life experiences, you can put them in your work, and maybe they'll go away. That you don't have to deal with them. And the more I kept on writing about this thing, that you know, the more I realized that it wasn't going anywhere. So I thought, okay, well, if it's not getting anywhere, and I can't afford therapy at this point in time then maybe I should turn this into a novel. And I guess also on some level, I was like, you're 23 years old. What are you, what, what are you gonna be writing an autobiography or memoir about? You know, you haven't lived. Mm. You know, so I started writing a novel, but I wanted to take that thing that happened to me, that awful, awful thing that happened to me and place it even closer to home, you know, where, where it happened like in a, in, in a town away from where I was born. I wanted, I wanted to bring it home and, and actually make it even more brutal. But also bring those feelings that, that I had, those feelings that I had when it was happening, you know, where after you've, you've realized that you really there's nothing you can do to get away from it, you can just, the only thing you can use is your mind when, when, when your body can, cannot help you. And so after that, you know, dealing with, um, how difficult it is to write it. Because I remember, <laughs> funny enough, I just, I just played a gig and I'd planned for weeks and weeks to write the scene. And I just couldn't sit down. I just couldn't sit down and write it. I just couldn't sit down and write it. And I remember it was, my, it was the first gig of my life or the second one and they paid me in a bottle of rum. Oh. You know? And I was like, no, but, but I still remember, <laughs> for me, for me, I still remember thinking they paid me. Baba Kuro. No, I was like, they paid me it's something. I, I, I've made it, you know. And, <laughs> and, I, and I didn't really drink at that time, but I remember I got home, poured myself some rum, and I sat down on my, on my computer and I just, I wrote it. I wrote it. And, but I, it was also, it, also the most experimental section of, of, of the novel where it's two texts almost fighting against each other. And I, I wanted to use that, that experimentation with, with, with the brain and what's happening in, uh, physically and, and also with texts maybe from the Bible and reappropriating them into, the, in, 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 into what was happening in order to show how, um, how ugly what was happening was, you know? Because sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, when yeah. I struggle sometimes when sexual assault or things that are ugly, like murder, or at least, you know, mm -hmm. or violence, where they are the pictured so beautifully. And, and I always think it, it takes away from... The brutality of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I wanted people, I wanted people to read it and go, Jesus, wow, this is, this is, this is awful. I don't want this to ever happen to anyone. To anyone, I don't want to do this to anyone. You know, and I also wanted people who, I mean, I, I guess it's tricky for people who have gone through it, right? But I, but I also wanted people maybe who had family members to understand how ugly it is, because beauty, and this is something I've been thinking about for almost a decade. Is that like beauty? Beauty can be irresponsible. You know, uh, uh, what do you mean by beauty can be irresponsible? What does that mean? <laughs> Because I, I mean, you know, I, I mean, if I think I, you all are beautiful and responsible. You'd be surprised. <laughs> <laughs> I'm responsible with my work. That's the only thing I'm responsible for. Otherwise, I'm just a child. But, um, but I think that you you can't. Well, you can, of course, if depending on what you're doing as an artist, you can use juxtaposition. But this is a theory of mine where I always ask myself: Should this thing, the song, the sound. This word should it be should it be pretty? Should it be pleasing to the senses of the overwhelming amount of people, like the, the majority of people? And I always ask myself, if it is pleasing, it is nice, if it sounds good or it reads nicely, what is it gonna do to them when they when, when they face it? You know, so that's where I, I think sometimes beauty, actually not irresponsibly, but beauty has a responsibility to get out of the way you know, and allow something else to actually do the work because it, it, beauty can be quite um, obfuscating and it, it, it can hide things instead of revealing them. I think for your particular work, I think many people who may have heard about someone having an out-of-body experience um, were able to sort of read the text in your book dealing with rape and understand how people can divorce themselves from what's happening to them at the moment. 
It's also the power of the mind, you know, the power. The, mm. What also how the mind can completely um, sabotage you. I see. Yeah. Unoma, you you wrote about all sorts of difficulty and trauma, but yours is you know it's your life. It's not fiction. You just talk openly about it. And one of the things that really sort of struck me in your book. Um, was dealing with the priest. I wondered if you might want to talk a little bit about that experience, and if possible, maybe just read a little bit about that for us. Yeah, um, I encountered a lot of uh, priests because I had to go <laughs> through a number of deliverances. Yeah, of course. And, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> we, we, so it just seems to be a theme in queer lives around black people all over the world. We all have to be delivered. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> and I can't tell even the craziest of what one of which tried to rape me, but that's a story for another day. The trauma in terms of um, feeling alone because everybody feels there's something wrong with you and uh, you're the only one against this basically a crowd of people who feel that there's something wrong with you. So it comes to a certain point where you even begin to believe that something is wrong with you and you let yourself be humiliated in every sense, obliterated in every sense. And unfortunately, these pastors had a lot to do with it. They also had a lot to, to do with my resurrection because it got to a point where I said, to hell with all of you, this is who I am. <laughs> and... <laughs> And that's what it's going to be. So one of, one of the uh, trauma included one of the many conversion therapies I had to uh, undergo. And I, I would like to read just a few paragraphs. I think people would like to hear you read from the text. So please go ahead. OK, thank you. I was shivering. He was, he was raving like a mad dog. I didn't believe his dumb words. The water was getting chilly. I wanted to sail out of a river and tell the man to go to hell. But I wanted to complete this process, to redeem myself and to prove to my mother that there was nothing wrong with me. If I didn't complete the seven days of prayers and deliverance, my mother might say that I was not willing mm. to try and be saved. I stood there in the middle of a river as the waves pushed me back and forth. In near panic, so many thoughts clashed in my head. What if a hippopotamus sprang out of the blue and attacked me? River snakes, but the waves ebbed and a calm wind seemed to have eased the flow of the river. I stood there firmer and thought about my mother, my grandmother and Onishé. They could protect me. I could feel the clay sands giving way under my feet. I would feel like I was sinking and then I'll be steadied. I waited to see mommy water. There was nothing. Even the rustling sounds of the shrubs, when Wite sat, became silent. I was counting the minutes and the hours. It felt like eternity. I turned around and saw a shadow scrambling away, tearing through stunted shrubs as if being chased. Another long silence, then a whiff of marijuana assailed my nose. I set her shaking violently from the cold. There was dead silence except for the washing of the waves and the sounds of the wild owls hooting from afar. I rocked my way to the dry land and then scuttled through the bushes in the direction I thought I came. The large tall leaves of elephant grasses slashed away at my face as I frantically surged forward trying to retrace my way home. Dim lights I had helped. They helped me follow a path that looked familiar. I heard voices and I hurried toward them. Two fishermen were disentangling their fishing nets under a street light. But as soon as I lodged toward them, they froze. Then they abandoned their nets and galloped into the night. One of them almost fell. He steadied his frame and kept sprinting. I only wanted to ask them for directions. Mm. That's so, so, so powerful. Thank you for doing that. And um, 
I, I just want to pick it up from that. Nicole, would you would you be able to read a little bit for us at this moment? Yes, definitely. <laughs> All right. um, let's see, with this section where she's finally getting um, to know what's really going on uh, with being alone. There are two types of devil's cold. One in which you cannot bring yourself to leave the room, much less the bed, to do the simplest things. And the other in which you go through the motions in a constant stupor. Hatsy lies in bed, turned away from the dark, heavy thing that has returned. It's shadow dimming the room. With the cover over her head, she closes her eyes, not wanting to see it. God knows how long she has gone without eating. She could die, she knows, though death doesn't seem that scary after all. Not as scary as a dark thing. Here in America, there are no bush teas for it. No bitter mix of ram goat roses, rosemary, lemongrass, bissy, or other herbs. No pasta to come with a bottle of sanctified olive oil. No neighbor from the country who can wring the neck of a goat and sever it with a machete for you to bathe in its blood. No time to lie down and let it run its course. She's powerless against it. The real hell is allowing this place to eat you alive, Fiona says to Patsy, when she notices that Patsy has been lying in the same spot on the bed inside their studio from sunup till sundown. How many rotations has the sun gone through since Patsy climbed in the bed that night after seeing Cicely? She slips in and out of sleep. She wakes to Fiona shaking her. Patsy, Patsy, Patsy. It reminds Patsy of her daughter's voice, how it would pull Patsy from the lips of a deep sleep. Here, she's in the mix of it, hating it, terrified of it. And yet her only thought is of true, her daughter. During those years, it was the anticipation of going to America to see Sicily that had kept Patsy alive. But what is keeping her alive now? Where will she find the strength that would protect her from the spells? How can she live knowing that she lost Sicily to her American dream? It's then that what Fiona had said about not having the luxury of choosing love makes sense to Patsy. That's what it all comes down to, choice. When has she ever been given a choice? Never. Mm. She was never given the choice to say no the first time her legs were pried open. Never given a choice to rid her body of the grievance she had to carry for nine months. Never given a choice to look at another woman for, and, and allow herself to be carried by the feeling without blood. Bright red on glistening glass, sticking to her like shadow. And now, now the promise of life comes with accepting the fact that she will never have a choice. That was just wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. That was that was just, I think, you know, one of the great things about Patsy's um, story is that all of us recognize it. I mean, you don't have to come from any particular country just be to just know all the difficulties of not having choices. And, you know, queer people all over the world, choices are made for us. Yeah. And one of the, the the most wonderful things is that you just you just laid it bare on the page for everyone. So yeah. Nakana, would you please also read a little bit for the Ake audience? We would sure. love to hear you engage in your text, and then we can continue. <laughs> I have some some other um, less uh, challenging questions for you, but please go ahead. <laughs> well, this is from Piggy Boys Blues, and this is chapter ten. It's called Two and a Half Kids and a Dog. They walked back to the car with Davida dragging slightly behind. Gray had to repeatedly turn to hurry him along. It was a humid afternoon. Again, Davida cursed himself for not wearing a hat. For when the sun did appear from under all those clouds, it burned his face as if it had an agenda. Striding past ambling students with blazers hanging over their forearms, Davida had to smile apologetically at some of them as Gray knocked them out of, this, out of his way. They arrived at his car, and as he reached for the keys to unlock the doors, he looked up over the roof of the car at Davide and sighed loudly. Was I foolish? he asked, his chest heaving slightly. Davide shook his head. Grace surveyed his surroundings. Suburban East London. Suburban bliss? Davide smiled. Whose? Gray asked. The parents of those children you were parting with the shoulders. Gray gave a short chortle and fell into his seat. 
David mirrored him. I wanted this, Gray said after another loud sigh. A house in the suburbs? David asked. Gray nodded solemnly. He wound his window down. That ad, two and a half kids, a dog, and he furrowed his brow. What was the other part of the statistic? A wife? David helped. Yes. Gray lifted his head and laughed sadly. That's an interesting part of the statistic to forget. A wife. They watched the waves break in the surf foam white. Gray fiddled with the knobs of, of the radio. He searched for the station and then, finding nothing pleasing to his ears, abruptly switched it off. The sky was heavy but threatened no rain. He sighed. How tall was that first teacher he was talking to? He asked. I don't understand. David straightened his, his posture. You do. How tall was he? Gray asked. Almost as tall as he is. David answered. I see. Gray opened the door and rested his right foot on the tar, scraping the sole of his shoe as it landed. Well, we're here. Let's not waste this day. I'm going swimming. He threw the car keys onto David's lap and ran towards the sea. As if he had remembered something, he stopped shy of the shore and walked back to loose the sand. He undressed, first his golf shirt, then his pants. He left his briefs on. He put his shoes on top of the articles to safeguard them against the wind and stuffed his socks and washed inside them. Then he walked towards the fringe of the shoreline and stood in the shallows, wetting his feet. The sand teemed with creeping shelled life, and then it disappeared again. He walked forward, digging his feet into the wet sand. With the water now up to his waist, he navigated the repetition of the waves. A big one came, and it jumped up against it. The water was now up to his chest and stung cold every time it lapped up to his shoulders and neck. He took the moment in. To his left, dunes rose high and soft and sandy with greenery on the peaks like heads of hair. On his right, a headland stood uncrumbling to the ocean. A wave came and he jumped up against it. This time the water wet his face and some of it went up his nose. He blew it out of his nostrils, and as he wiped his face with his palms, a wave caught him off balance and knocked him over. All was muffled. He was under and flailing while the wave dragged him towards the shore. It was surprisingly hard hit, and as it surfaced, Gray hated himself like he'd never done before. He imagined what a fool he must have looked like to whoever was watching him. Coughing and sore, he rose and walked to his clothes. Davido was sitting next to them, smiling. Gray dropped, the sa dropped to the sand. Your turn, he said. Nope. Davida shook his head once with finality. Yes, Gray said. Davida spoke. White people brought us swimming clothes for a reason. Davida raised his eyebrows. For shame. Why do you assume we never had gear for swimming before they came? Gray frowned ter terribly. What shame, he added. There's something in the ritual. In the ritual? We know everything about ritual. The specializing of the garment, of this piece of material, this here is for this reason, so if you wear it, however scant it is, you won't be embarrassed because it is serving its purpose. Simple, seething, basic shame, Gray. Gray smiled. The discomfort caused by the knock was subsiding. You're ashamed of your cock, he said plainly and dully, and decided against a smile. I'm not swimming in my underwear, Derrida said. Ritual, he laughed mockingly, bobbing his head. It's all about the cock. <laughs> it, it, it does somehow the whole world revolves around that somehow or the other <laughs> thank you so you much thank you thank for, you for the good, very, for the good and the bad <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much i i wanted to see if we could spend some time talking about um craft and how you put these things these these are just incredibly wonderful books so um nicole i'll start with you if you don't mind um Patsy is a, in an incredible book. I wanted to know, while writing Patsy, what was your favorite libation? Was it Prosecco or was it Rosé? Yes, but in terms of even, um, but in terms of craft-wise right, while writing Patsy, a lot of things that um, Nakane had said earlier had crossed my mind because, I mean, Patsy came to me as um, a first-person narrative. I mean, this woman was basically telling me her story through letters written to her mother. And in terms of how trauma associated with her, not only leaving her daughter behind, but growing up as a child herself, who was abandoned by a mother who kind of fled to the church emotionally. Um, so, you know, Mama G, who's Patsy's mother, was actually, she had more Jesus figurines in the house more than, more than food in the cupboard. 
And Patsy mm -hmm. came up with seeing that. Um, and then when it came on to her sexuality, it was her kind of just discovering that she just loved girls. That she loved Sisley in particular. Um, and then uh, when, when, by the time the novel ended, I wanted it to be a redemption story uh, more than anything else. Um, in that, you know, yes, Patsy ends up with Claudette, who she ultimately meets in Brooklyn. And true that her gender nonconforming daughter com um, has a community around her in a country like Jamaica, where, you know, you know how, about the homophobia. But for true, being that she's Roy's daughter, Sergeant Beckford's daughter, she can walk around in boys' clothes and not be assaulted. You know, um, she can have her, she she's surrounded by all his, these boyfriends of hers who are also soccer players, and that that kind of gave her freedom to be herself in that country, existing in her community in Pennyfield. Um, and so I wanted to do that. Um, not that I was forcing it, but. In a sense, I, I also craved um, the queer literature that yes, it talks about our trauma. I don't think it's um, I don't think it should be left out of the narratives um, that what a lot of people are pushing for um, um, lately. However, um, in, in addition to talking about the truth of our trauma, uh, uh, as fiction writers, we also have the license to create worlds for our characters that we never have. Right, yeah. and, and or also create worlds that our readers can also stretch their imaginations as well. Um, so that's really ultimately um, what I was trying to do in a book like Patsy, and also in subsequent novels um, that I'll write as well. Oh, wonderful! Uh, for for Unoma, who you can't create a world because you are writing nonfiction and memoir, so you are dealing with the world that you have. So in dealing and writing about all of these wonderful things, just joyous things, but also this very challenging things happening to uh, a lesbian in Eastern Nigeria who moves to Lagos. I just wonder, as you were formulating your chapters and thinking of how you're putting this on the page, was your libation of choice Ogoguru, palm wine, rosé, or Prosecco? It was palm wine, no, serious palm wine. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and, and now we've gotten that out of the way. Tell me about the craft of putting this wonderful memoir together. Well, a lot of it, ironically, uh, I don't know if I should say ironically, had to do with anger because I just hated the fact that the homosexual community, basically, or the LGBT community, are consistently being erased and being told that they don't exist. And I just said to myself, you have to tell your story. If those who insist that we don't exist hold on to that notion, I'm sure there are little girls like me who are lesbians who may want to know that they're not alone. I didn't yeah. have that when I was growing up. So I said to myself, why not create it? So that's how that started. And then of course, writing it was very difficult because it made me peel open some of the wounds that were basically have healed, some completely healed. So it was it was painful because at some point I cried. It's in certain scenes I cried, and um, I thought about specific uh, incidents, and then I struggle with how do I put them together so that it can be uh, coherent or to make sense because the thoughts and the whole experience, as far as I'm concerned, were really fragmented. You know, there was, to me, there were basically no sense in some things that happened to me. So that took me longer. So I had carried my, the story of my life in my head for when I started consciously uh, thinking about writing it for like seven years, you know, so, and then putting it down, I had to, when I'm done with a specific chapter, depending on how intense, it was or it is, I, I, I'll leave it and go away from it for a while and then come back to it again. Um, so the whole process was, it was painful, but it was actually therapeutic. Mm. I felt, yeah. I felt healed. Thank you so much. Thank yeah, you. I, you know, I, one of the, the things that I, uh, advice I was given um, a few years ago by a great South African writer, uh, Sisonke Unsimang, was that I should write you know, not from my wounds, but from my scars. And I think that wow. many of us who deal with trauma and things like that, when we write from our wounds, it doesn't quite come out as healing as when we write from the scars that we've had. And um, Nakane, you have poured in, in your novel, a lot of trauma, but a lot of joy. And I, I just wondered, Piggy Boy Blues is, is, is a, it's an experimental book. It's, it's different. It's, it's quite joyous. Do you consider that book a, a classy, bougie, or just ratchet? 
all of the above. <laughs> <laughs> it, knows, it, it knows how to talk. And, 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 and then walk us through your process of putting this ratchet work together that came out so, well, so, so lovely. <laughs> uh, well, I'll answer your first question. My choice of libation, what did I drink? I didn't drink anything. Prosecco, Prosecco no, or rosé? Nothing. I didn't drink. Gin? Nothing. Uh, Water. Water and coffee. Water. Okay, that's good. Yeah. We'll go with that. I'm, really, I'm, and I'm so, really boring. But the book is not. How did that book come together from your head to the page? Well, as I said earlier on, initially the book was something else. And it was something quite big and bloated and biblical and um, almost a celebration of manhood in a way. Because when I wrote it, I was quite, a, I was a Christian. And so when I got my publishing deal, out of that version of the book, I sat back and I read it and I hated what I'd written, you know, because I was a completely different person. I didn't believe in the same things anymore. So on some level, I wanted to rewrite it. So I went to the Eastern Cape where the book was set and to my uncle's house and I rewrote the entire thing. And I remember making a decision that I wanted the book to be quite episodic. I wanted it to move as if, like, you know how like in, in the Old Testament, in the Bible, in Genesis, how things move really rapidly, right? But you know, you still know who's, who's involved and what the characters are going through. But somehow character stories can change and really, really fast without any explanation. So I was using on some level that conceit of the, opposite, of the biblical episodic, well, I guess, form. Mm -hmm. And also turning it upside down Right, so using something that maybe doesn't like you, <laughs> like those like, for example, like, <laughs> queer people, are not, queer characters are not <laughs> in the Bible, right? So, so I was, in, I was like, okay, so how do I take? This I don't know. Thing? That's a matter of debate, you know. There's some queer characters debate, in the Bible that, was, that people don't seem to realize are queer, and I celebrate it. So. True. I'm, you know, now I'm now I'm seeing it a little differently. But then, when I was like in my twenties mm -hmm. and angry and wanted to sort of right with right with anger you know mm. i was so sort of, i was kicking against this the spoke that has been used against people like me and people like us at least and i said mm. i want to take this thing that has used us you know and i want to use it i want to use the language i want to use how mm. some of the books are made but make it a little more you know ratchet and write about sex and write about <laughs> you know, in a way that you wouldn't say that well except for song of songs actually which is quite dirty but another thing was that i wanted to create characters that didn't have arcs you know that mm. that didn't learn anything that you know what you, you what they were in the beginning would maybe be what they would be in the end because i think sometimes a lot of human beings don't change well, I thought about that when I finished Piggy Boy Blues, that I was just wondering if that was a setup for perhaps a mm. sequel, because there's a lot of loose ends in, in these characters that we sort of like, okay, so now what? Are you telling us now that you just decided to write characters without arcs just because, not because we're going to get more later? Well, the second book that I'm writing right now, I guess on some level, is is a part of a timeline. But... The way I saw it in my mind, right, is that like there's a timeline like of of human beings, and it, it moves and moves and moves. And sometimes in in in, in story making, we we sort of show the entire timeline. And what I wanted is that like you meet someone, let's say today, and what you have is that this timeline cut up, and mm -hmm. until maybe you never see them again, and a timeline is cut up again, you know. And so I wanted you to meet these characters for that period, just from that cut up timeline, without thinking about mm. what did they learn? What is the arc? What happened to get them? <laughs> but, it, but I also know, I know, I know that it annoyed a lot of people because people 
will come into the board. It was, it was, it was certainly different, and um, we're almost out of time. But this, I have one question for for each of you, and we'll start with Nicole. Um, if you all writers, um, no one's a village. You know, we are we are lifted up by people, and I just wanted all of us to think about people in the literary community, past or present, dead or alive, and just answer this question. So, Nicole, which literary figure would you want to kiss, marry? I know you're married, but marry but also avoid. Give us three people. Who would you kiss, marry, or avoid? Oh, three people. All right, so let me start with my literary um, mother, Toni Morrison, um, in terms of that, that embrace, that motherly, grandmotherly embrace, because even just now, since in the pain it's um, her what narrative arc, she gave me permission to write black woman sexuality on the page, and she gave me per um, the license to dare to write outside of the box, right? Yeah. Um, because I, I did my MFA program and I was given white men's books to read as the end all and be all of literature. And so Toni Morrison to me, she embodies everything. Um, she could be the three persons. Zora Neale Hurston, second, because she gave me the permission of language. Wait, would, and would, you, like, would you kiss Toni or would you marry Toni? <laughs> oh, that's a controversial one. I'll, I'll, I'll yeah, probably we, who would I'll you kiss out of Toni Morrison and Zora Neale Hurston? I want to give her a grandmotherly kiss and maybe Zora Neale Hurston would be that embrace um, because of course language, the permission of using my Jamaican patois in, the, in dialogue and she did that with her stories. And in terms of Mary, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, a great poet, um, biostatistician, um, Dr. Emma Ben. Um, so she'll be the one and marry again and again. So <laughs> There's a third part of that question, who would you avoid? Oh my gosh, who would I avoid? I would probably avoid all the white British men that I would give. Oh my God, yes, yes, I was gonna say that. I was gonna say that. I was gonna say that. Yes, okay. <laughs> Professor Unoma, <laughs> when it comes to literary, literary figures, who would you kiss, who would you marry, and who would you avoid? I would want to marry Flora Wapa. And I yes. want to kiss. <laughs> I want to kiss Audrey Lord. Oh yeah. And I want, yes. Yes. <laughs> and I want to run away from Joseph Conrad. Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay then. Nakani, it's your turn. I'm looking at the clock here. Literary figures. Oh. Who would you want to kiss? Oh. Who would you want to marry? And who would you avoid? I would kiss James Baldwin because he changed my life and he wrote the best sex scenes ever. Um, and also he put black, like, like Tony Morrison, you know, he made black queer people and, and straight people, whatever, but black people, you know, people who are sexy, you know, and you could see their bodies. I loved it. I'd love to marry um, two people. I'd love to marry um, Franz Fanon and I'd love to marry... Uh, Martin, no, Malcolm X, because he did, he also was a writer. Yes, I, I, he was. I, 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 I know the difference. Might have married you. It's 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 unclear. Um, in 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 the in the in 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 the biographies of him, he, you know, he might have been open to that. Oh, yeah. very clear. <laughs> no, 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 it's, no it's, it's not very clear. But it's, people are just talking, you know. Um, who would I avoid? I, well, you know, like Nicole said, I would avoid. A, a lot of, especially like early 20th century white writers who didn't even see us as human beings, but always dragged us into their pages. I just read like Lady Chatley Lover by Dish Lawrence. And this is supposed to be a book about freedom. And it's just like, this is this book, like white men just want to be on top all the time, you know? So avoid <laughs> black <men. laughs> <laughs> they want to be on top all the damn time. All the time. <laughs> and if they don't know what to okay. talk about. Yeah. Now, you all have um, incredible books, which I must mention. Patsy, Embracing My Shadow, and Piggy Boy Blues are at the Weeda Bookstore, and you can get them delivered to you. If you're not in Lagos, just call them. They have all those wonderful books. I'm not sure how I feel about you know this wonderful panel. Not even one of them wanted to kiss me. Not even like a friendly friendly kiss, but that's a whole different story. <laughs> but that's a whole different story. My last question for you guys is I want you all to just tell us 
there are a lot of challenges in being a writer today, writing queer, writing black, but if you could just give us some of the joys that have come out of, um, of your work and um, we'll, we'll start with uh, the professor. <laughs> Well, the no, joy no, that would be you. <laughs> the joy, the joy has the joy has come out of my work is uh, letting it all out. Like I said earlier, I feel that I've, I'm uh, I'm healed mostly, and uh, the fact that my you have embraced your shadow. Yes, I have. No going back. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what else? I think I pretty much said everything. And the fact that my difference. My difference has actually empowered me, so that's wonderful. Yeah. Yes, yes. Okay, thank you so much, Nicole. Yes. Uh, so, what has come out of me uh, writing Patsy, and I wanted like the product placement here. I really love the fact that first of all, it's a black woman's name, Patsy. A lot of us know Patsy. This is the one we have in Nigeria. Yes, right. Thank so you. So that one you have there is for a, the white American. people in America. <laughs> this one we have in Africa. Exactly. It's a woman's name, Patsy. Um, you know, especially in a time of the you know, say her name. And I think for me, growing up working class Jamaican um, woman and being socialized to to actually, you know, just celebrate not celebrate my own voice, but really be ashamed and silent. And now having a book like a Patsy out there, seeing our interior lives means a lot and to know that other people not only jamaican women or jamaicans in general but people in general seeing the story um seeing the, this one woman and her humanity and seeing that it touched many lives of different individuals um given the other um the, the issues that are uh, why, why am i blanking in terms of in terms of um but it, it, just seeing the, the humanity of this character um that means a lot to me thank you so very much for bringing patsy uh to the page for us now can I, Tell us about the joy. The joy, the joy is finding out that you're not alone. You know, you go, you have panel panel discussions like this, and you realize that people across oceans who are like you, you know, because I think a lot of queer people, whether they are in families that are loving and accepting, there's still the world out there that is going to tell them that they are uh, pieces of shit and that they shouldn't, they should change, that they, they should have deliverance. And so for me, you know, art in, in all its mediums ha is just a continual showing that you're not alone, you know? And that even if it's hard, make the thing that, that, that might help someone else realize that they're not alone, mm -hmm. you know? All right, wonderful. Unoma Azwa, Nicole Dennis Ben. Nakane, thank you so much for joining us on the Ake stage. Thank you. We are really, thank really you. grateful. Everyone can find the books, Patsy, Embracing My Shadow, and Piggy Boy Blues at the Weeder Bookstore. Thank you, well, thank you, sense. thank you. <laughs>